Just a reminder to our Speculating Wildly About Crime listeners, this is for entertainment purposes only and solely the thoughts and opinions of our team. We do invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to Speculating Wildly About Crime. Tonight, I'm going to be your host. I'm Jamie. We're going to be discussing the case of Brandon Lawson. Side note, we are going back to Texas. We also are going back to an abandoned car. You love these (laughs) abandoned car mysteries. I can't get away from either of these things. However, I do kind of think it's a thing of mine because every time I see an abandoned car on the side of the road, my head goes to Unsolved Mysteries and it goes down a whole rabbit hole. And so here we are. Brandon lived in San Angelo, Texas. Fairly small city, it's about 100,000 people. And at the time that he disappeared, he had a living girlfriend by the name of Ladessa, who he met when he was in high school. They were high school sweethearts, weren't quite married. They were together for about 10 years. And I think Texas is a common law state, right? So if you live with somebody long enough, you're married. They had three children of their own. And then Brandon had a child from a previous marriage as well. So they had a seemingly happy relationship, had his problems as every relationship does. Brandon also had a pretty close-knit family. He had two parents who he was still pretty close with, and then he also had three siblings. The closest of his siblings was probably his brother, Kyle, which we're going to talk about quite a bit in this case. But Kyle actually lived less than a mile from Brandon. So they were like best friends, essentially. At the time of the disappearance, um, Brandon was working in an oil field and Ladessa was working at a daycare. I will note that Brandon, he's just about to start a new job. And Brandon was a great soul. He was super kind. He was super nice, uh, but doesn't come without faults. So Brandon did get in trouble with the law a little bit. In his past life, uh, he had some run-ins with drugs. He, I think at one point, was maybe even referred to as an addict for a little bit. He had come in and out of this drug use or abuse, and then he had been to jail a couple times and actually had been arrested at least three times in his life. Do you want to know that from all research that I read up on, all the charges that he had brought against him were nonviolent drug charges? I think it's important to note that it wasn't like armed robbery or murder or anything like that. Now I want to dive into the timeline of the night that he disappeared. So we're going to go back to August 8th into August 9th of 2013. We're going to start with 1130 that night. That is the time that Brandon calls his father, who lives three hours away, and says, hey, Ladessa and I are in a really big fight. I don't want to be here tonight. I think I'm just going to come to your house. And Brandon's father was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's going on? It's pretty late. This is three hours away. Just go cool off somewhere. What we didn't know in the beginning was we thought Brandon had this fight with Odessa, ran off and did his thing. But what we will find out listening to some interviews that both Kyle and Odessa did, Brandon had unfortunately had a little bit of a relapse around the time that he went missing. And he had reached out to Kyle a day or two before the disappearance and said, hey, I just passed a drug test from a new job and now I want to get high because I can, right? And his drug of choice was unfortunately meth. And so Kyle was like, I don't think you should do that. However, if you want to, here you go type of thing. Listening to Kyle's interviews, it sounds like Brandon also maybe had done, and again, I say maybe because nothing is put in court documents or anything. There was nothing like officially stated that he had done meth that night. But Ladessa and Kyle did interviews that basically stated he went out and did drugs. And Ladessa said, this is why we had the fight that night. Ladessa is very adamant about, we have four children in this house and I will not tolerate that around my children. And so if that is what you want to do and that's what you want to fight about, and this is the hill you're going to die on tonight, I'm going to need you to go outside of this house. Now, after he left in this fury, she did end up calling him and saying, hey, why don't you come back? Why don't you go to your brother's house? But he was just in this fuck it all attitude and 
was going to go to his dad's house. So he drove away and ignored her calls. Also going on this night, their youngest child, which I think was under the age of two, went to the ER and was battling an ear infection, among other things. So they're battling having three kids at home, one of them sick. I don't think they had a ton of money. And now we got Brandon, who's got this drug thing going on. I'm sure there's a lot of fuck you, fuck yous going back and forth that night. That was at 1130. He calls his dad and says, hey, I'm going to your house. It wasn't until 1154 that night that Brandon decides to actually leave the house despite what his father told him. And in this fury of leaving his house, Brandon grabbed what would be the only cell phone charger that they had that would plug into a wall. In my mind, it's like that final fuck you of, and I'm taking the cell phone charger, good fucking luck, type of thing, right? Because Jamie has probably done that a time or two in her life. And why this is important to know, because as I go on with the timeline, there's going to be some calls with Ladessa that are missed, and you're going to go, oh, what the fuck? But what happened was once uh, Lodessa realized that she didn't have a cell phone charger, she ended up bringing her phone to her car, which could charge on the car battery. So her phone was out in the car for the rest of the night. That was at 11.54. He grabs the charger. He leaves the house. And he's going three and a half hours north on his way because I'm sure he's in a fury. I'm sure he's like, I just want to get the fuck out of here and get away from everybody. Brandon calls Kyle and says, my truck ran out of gas. This is at 12.30 a.m. He was on Route 277 between San Angelo, which is where he lived, and Bronte, Texas, which is a town of like 500 people. Around the time that Brandon left his house, he had called Kyle like in this weird, I'm pissed off at my girlfriend frenzy and said something like, Ladessa has Mexicans chasing me and they're chasing me out of the neighborhood and da 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 da. And Kyle was like, uh, are you tweaking, bro? Like, what's going on? He's like, no, she's she's chasing me out of the neighborhood. She has all these people coming after me. And Kyle's like, okay, we'll just like go to dad's or go sleep it off or whatever you're gonna do. Right. So 1230, Brandon calls Kyle to say that he doesn't have gas. Kyle doesn't have money. He also doesn't have a gas can. He ended up getting hold of Ladessa somehow. And Ladessa said, well, I have the four kids at home. I'm going to leave the gas can on the porch. You come and pick it up. So Kyle got his wife, his four-year-old child into the car at 1230 AM with the gas can to go rescue Brandon. Then we jump forward to 1250. Brandon makes this infamous 911 call. And if you search Brandon Lawson, you see it all over the internet. What I want to do right now is we're going to listen to one round of the 911 call. It's not going to make a ton of sense. We're not going to talk about it a ton right now, but I want you to listen to it. Start thinking about what you think you hear. Start thinking about what you think could be happening. Then I'm going to go through the rest of the timeline. Then we're going to listen to it again a couple of times. 13, 0, 50, and 13. Eight seconds. I know Janelle probably has some questions and some thoughts, but I'm going to ask you to hold them for just 30 seconds. That's all it's going to take for me to get through the rest of this timeline. Two things I want to note here. One is Brandon is in a very desolate area. So phone calls are dropping. Things aren't connecting very well. And so when you hear me say he called and left a voicemail, he called and it was a missed call. A lot of that we got to take with a grain of salt. The other thing to note is a lot of these calls are coming in rapid fire and 
you're going to see that it's coming from two or three people. If I call Janelle and she doesn't pick up and then I call Luke, when Janelle calls me back, it's going to go to voicemail. And so when you see that shit happening, it's not that necessarily Brandon was ignoring somebody's call. He might just be on with another person. So 12.50, he makes a 911 call. 12.51, and literally must be right when he hung up because I think that 911 call is probably just about a minute, maybe 45 seconds. So 12.51, Kyle calls Brandon, leaves a voicemail. We could speculate it's because he's on the phone with 911. Also at 12.51, Brandon is calling Ladessa. Ladessa did not answer. Now, she got a lot of shit, but we have to remember her phone's in her car. He did the whole, fuck you, I left the charger, right? So if she didn't answer, I can't be too mad at her. Well, it's also the middle of the night. She's got right. four kids. She's probably exactly. asleep. And one was sick. Like, they had just been in the ER that same night. So we really can't throw her a lot of shade. No, I'm not mad at her. 12.52, Kyle's wife calls Brandon, calls him twice in a row, probably goes to voicemail. 12.54... Kyle called Brandon. Now, it seemed like this call went through. Probably wasn't very long, but I don't have a lot of context of what this conversation was. Now, this is very interesting. Again, Brandon called 911 at 12.50. At 12.56 a.m., there's another call that goes into 911 from a truck that's driving down this same highway. And this truck is reporting... Brandon's truck who's sticking out into the lane of traffic and this truck that's passing by basically says hey this is probably a safety hazard you should probably come out and check on this car there's no lights out here it's like a pitch black area 1257 Brandon calls his neighbor 1258 Brandon called Kyle two times in a row 12.58, again, probably within 30 seconds of each other. Matt, the neighbor, is calling Brandon back three times in a row. 12.59, Kyle calls Brandon again. At 1.04 a.m., the 911 dispatcher tried calling Brandon to try and get more information. And she ended up leaving a voicemail because he didn't answer. She did end up calling him back right away again. Didn't get an answer again. And at around 1.05 a.m., an officer finally did get out to where Brandon's truck was. And ironically, it's the same time that Kyle pulls up to Brandon's vehicle. The officer comes, says, hey, I'm doing the welfare check on this car. Kyle's like, hey, it's my brother's truck. It's totally fine. And they're talking, they're talking, they're talking. At 1.15, Brandon and Kyle are now on the phone, but Kyle is not telling the officer that he's on the phone with Brandon. He's only telling the officer that, I know this is my brother's truck. He ran out of gas. I'm going to get him gas. We're going to take care of it. Now, what the officer doesn't know is Kyle's on the phone with Brandon, and Brandon is saying, I can see you, but you can't see me. When Brandon sees the cops, Brandon says to Kyle one time, which was their code word for cops. So he says, one time, run. And Kyle says, I don't have any reason to run. And he said, where's your pride, motherfucker? And then he hangs up on him. But in the call, he asked for the cops to come. Right. So there's a whole lot to unwrap here. We knew that Brandon had been in trouble with the law in the past. Brandon had a warrant out for his arrest and he had found this out maybe a couple months earlier when he was trying to pay off some tickets or register a car or something. For whatever reason, they didn't arrest him at that time, but there was basically some type of like, if you run in with the cops again, they can arrest you type of thing because you have an active warrant. And so he was essentially hiding in the woods or so Kyle thought because he has this warrant. What's even more interesting is there's an officer at the vehicle and Kyle's at the vehicle. Neither the officer or Kyle know that Brandon had just called 911 less than 15 minutes ago. Nobody tells him that. 
So they have no fucking idea. So to the officer, he's doing his job. He's coming up on this abandoned vehicle. He's trying to make sure things are going to be safe. So Kyle, so he, was the cop there because of Brandon or because of the mm -mm. call that came in about the truck being in the road? No, the cop was there because he got the call at 12.56 that a truck was in the road. He had no idea that a 911 call was placed at 12.50. Kyle's there because he thinks my brother ran out of gas. Now he's telling me this weird shit in the field. He's telling me to run away from the cops and it's a whole fucking thing. So then at 118, there was a text message that went out to Brandon from Kyle's wife that said the cops are at your truck. The phone never pinged again after 119 a.m. Now I want to play the 911 call again without visual. Then I want to play the 911 call again without visual slowed down. And then we're going to play the 911 call with visual. I want everybody to listen to the call these next two times and see what you can pick up. Zero, 50, and 38 seconds. 911 emergency. Yeah, I'm in the middle of the field. It's like we're just pushing guys over. Right here going towards Javelin on both sides. My truck ran out of gas. There's one car here. I got to take the, to the woods. Please hurry. Okay, now run that by me. I'm no, not talking to him. Hi, so you ran into him. Ah, you ran into him. Okay. Got the first guy. Do you need an ambulance? Yeah. No, I need the cops. Okay. Is anybody hurt? Hello? 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 Listening to it in the real time, what are some of your initial thoughts, questions? It sounded like he was out of breath. So to me, when he said I'm in the middle of a field, if he gets out of his truck and he's going into that field and he's being chased, and I'll put chased in quotes, chased by something, he might be out of breath. He said, I, I, I don't know what he said, but it sounded <laughs> like he said... Something about got one of them. So I go back and forth on that. That leads me to believe that somebody else is there. Like who got one of them? Who's with you? What's going on? And did we chase somebody away? Did somebody get pushed off? Did somebody get shot? Was his truck in the same condition mm -hmm. it was in? Yes. That's the other bananas piece is there was no damage to his truck at all. Zero. Which we know the truck is not there because it got pushed off the road or something. We know it's there because ran out of gas. He didn't check his gas tank before <laughs> he went on this journey. But it definitely sounded to me like he was either being chased or mm -hmm. chasing somebody. The one thing I can pick out is he definitely says, no, I need the cops. Right. You definitely can pick that up. You definitely clear as day. You can hear that I'm in the middle of a field. Mm -hmm. I do hear after she says, run that by me again. And he says, accidentally ran into him or says something like that. And she says, oh, you accidentally ran into him. Okay. Right when she says, okay. And before he says something else, it's very, very faint, but you can hear some other voice. And that could mean that there's somebody in the background saying something or it could mean he has a cell phone up like this and then it goes away from his face and he's talking as the speaker is going away from his face. So I could see either scenario. The okay. other thing I hear when she says, is anybody hurt? Do you need an ambulance? You can hear a faint, yeah. And then he says, no, I need the cops. Could be him, again, putting his phone away or he could be talking to somebody else or it could be a voice in the background. The other thing I want to know on this 911 call, and you can hear it when you hear it in real time, but you can hear it even more when you listen to it slowly. After she says, is anybody hurt? And he seemingly goes away and she says, hello, hello. You hear this whoosh, 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 whoosh. She can speculate into a million different things. There's a thousand people on the internet that say that's a gunshot. 
There's other people that say it's her breathing, it's him breathing, it's the road because there's a bridge that cars could pass over and it could be like, you know, when a car passes over a bridge, it's like, so you can kind of hear that type of noise. So maybe he was under the bridge and maybe that's where that's coming from. I'm going to debunk the gunshot shit. I'm not saying it's hundred percent not true, but we have to remember that Brandon made this 911 call at 12.50 a.m. He had the last phone call with his brother at around 1.15 a.m. And so if somebody's shooting him to kill him, I'm not making a call 30 minutes later. No, somebody could have shot him in the arm. Somebody could have shot him in the leg and he might be debilitated a little bit, maybe still able to talk. Because one of the calls that came through was said, I'm like 10 minutes up the road and I'm bleeding. And then it like cut out. That was right after the one time run. Where's your pride, motherfucker? Then there was another call that came through and he said, I'm 10 minutes up the road and I'm bleeding. So I guess for all you gunshot conspiracists out there, and he could have been shot and he could have been bleeding. And that could have been the that we hear on the call but it also could have been he would have fucking fell over a rock over anything and the last thing i want to put in everybody's brain is and maybe janelle you can speak to this because you live there but from everything i've heard it's very deserty like there's a lot of cactus they said and like thorn and prickly bushes You're in East, East Texas. That is not the state I live in. I am all concrete. Last time I checked, like Texas, it's all a state. You have to own all of it. The terrain was rough. There's greens and there's trees, but there's also like cactus and things like that. But the bigger issue here is there's a ton of snakes, like rattlesnakes that can bite you and kill you. And wild boar. Like, this is the wild boar party land. This is their Vegas. This is where they go wild out. I don't know how much Brandon was a daredevil or whatever. You couldn't pay me enough money to get out of my truck and go 10 feet into those fucking areas. Because we're just talking about snakes and boars. We're not talking about scorpions and spiders and cockroaches and all the other shit that's out there. But if that's what you're used to... It's still a no for me, dog. It's definitely a no for me. But adding in meth, like... I know. Maybe thought process wasn't at full capacity. If you're thinking somebody's chasing you and that's going to be your demise, I guess going into the woods is better than the guy behind me that's going to kill me. Maybe. I still say just stop before you head out. Just stop at at the quick trip. Just gas up right there. You don't have to worry about it later. This is PSA for all of our listeners. Just do it now. Make sure it's full. I will also go back to something had to have been seriously at a minimum going on in his head, if not seriously wrong. And I like to think probably seriously wrong because he called 911 when he was afraid of the cops. So something had to have been that scary for him to be like, I don't give a fuck if the police see me. I'd rather have that happen than die. Yeah, but does that mean that whatever this mystery thing was had resolved itself by the time the officer got there? Because in Brandon's head, he doesn't know that somebody else called 911. So he has to be thinking, that's the cop I requested. Very true. I never even thought of it. Why are you being a creeper in the woods when essentially your savior is here? Okay. So now we are going to play the video in slow motion. I want to put a caveat out here that when you're going to hear it in slow motion, people sound drunk, people sound funny. It's not necessarily the case here. It's just because the video is slowed down. 2013, 0, 50, and 38 seconds. Now, an emergency. See that thumb in the middle of the field? The site was just pushing guys over. Right here, going towards the avalanche on both sides. My truck ran out of gas. There's one car here that I checked it to the woods. 
Please learn. Okay, now, but I met Brownie. Mean, the more I talk to him, the I show you ran into him. Ah, you ran into him, okay. That's the first time. Uh, do you need an amulet? No, I need the call. Okay. Is anybody hurt? That did not help me in any way, shape, or form. I don't feel better about the call. Really? I thought when it was slowed down, some of the other stuff came to light for me. Uh, I still have no idea what the fuck Staper is. Staper, State Trooper, is Staper a word for something? Is he saying I escaped her? My gut tells me he's saying State Trooper and he's just putting the words so fast together that it sounds like Staper. Because he says, Staper, I'm in the middle of a field. Staper, just push some guys over, is what I hear. And then he says, my truck just ran out of gas. Out here going towards Abilene on both sides. No idea what he means by that. Like, why are we talking about both sides of the road? Why are we saying push some guys over? And then when he says, got the first one, not the first one, shot the first one, I hear first one, but I don't know what I hear prior to that. Yeah, same. And I do hear a little muffled something before got the first one, shot the first one, whatever, before that. It's like half a second. I don't know what that is. Then she goes into... Okay, run that by me again. And he talks about I accidentally ran into them. And then she says, oh, ran into them. Okay. I didn't hear it until it was slowed down. When she says, okay, you can faintly hear somebody say something. Again, it's muffled. I have no idea what they're saying. There's definitely a voice saying something before she moves into the next thing and says, is anybody hurt? And then the other thing, when she says, you need an ambulance, you can hear a very distinct, yeah. And then he says, no, I need the cops. And the yeah is muffled. And again, it could be somebody talking over here, or it could be him saying, yeah, with his phone way over here and then saying, no, I need the cops. So all of those things are very weird to me. And the other thing that really came into fruition a lot for me when we slowed it down was the ch -ch -ch -ch. I did make out the boom, 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 boom. Right? Okay, one, if it was the bridge, we would have heard it throughout the call. That's a very great point. I never thought of that. Two, there, it was only like a couple of times. So unless this is the shortest bridge in human history, I don't think that is bridge noise what if he was running this whole time and then got up to the bridge towards the end and again it's only what a 45 second call but what if he got up to the bridge towards the end of the call and he was at like the end of the bridge like if the bridge starts over here and it's way over here and he's way at this end you might only hear that at the that end would of make the sense of why he was so out of breath right but the very, very, very first time I heard the call, I did hear that. And to me, it sounded like the lady just going, Ugh. and not like sighing in an annoying way, but just more of like taking a breath. And I didn't note this earlier, but I should note the town Bronte, it's like 500 people. It's in the middle of fucking nowhere, obviously. They don't have a huge police force. So because it was such a small town and a small police force, the 911 calls actually went to a nursing home and it was the CNA or the nurse or whoever was on staff would grab the 911 calls. I don't know if a true 911 dispatcher <laughs> would have gotten any better out of that. No, but I think the two big things she missed was usually say 911, what's your emergency? And then you go into who are you and what's your name? She never got there. So now what I want to do is share the 911 call again in real time but we're going to watch a video with words one of my favorite true crime podcast duos true crime garage they actually spent like about eight or nine hours really breaking down this video slowing it down so what we see in here is not 
obviously 100% what happened that night, but I think it will help us piece together some of what we're hearing or what we think we're hearing. Oh, an emergency. Yeah, I'm in the middle of the field. It's like we're just pushing guys over. Right here going towards gasoline on both sides. My truck ran out of gas. There's one car here. I got to the woods. Please hurry. Okay, now run that by me. Yeah, we're not talking to him. Hi, so you ran into him. Ah, you ran into him. Okay. That's the first guy. Do you need an ambulance? Yeah. No, I need the cops. Okay. Is anybody hurt? Hello? 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 I still feel no better about the situation. <laughs> <laughs> Did you at least hear the yeah this time? Really? That is clear as fucking day to me. So we listened to this 911 call combined, what, 150 times? I still have so many questions. What is a staper? Who's chasing you? Who the fuck else is there? Okay, like so if he was shot or seriously injured, he would have run out when the cop and Kyle arrived. Very true. This is my saving grace. Like you said, he doesn't know that cop was there for another 911 call. He's thinking, oh, they're there because I called him. At that point, you would be like, anybody, I will flag down somebody right. just passing down this road. But I think, to your point earlier, whatever was his situation, minutes later, the situation has resolved itself, essentially. But he's still bleeding because he still calls kyle's wife and says i'm bleeding i'm 10, mi 10 minutes up the road and so kyle probably thought well if it was that fucking serious you would have ran out when you saw the cops and kyle will die on the hill that he's like i know brandon was there and he saw me and i couldn't see him the reason we have this timeline is because ladessa was able to get brandon's phone records after the fact within seven days we'll say she sees all these phone records and she says huh he called 911. That's interesting. Number one, because like we just talked about, nobody else fucking knew that he called 911. So why are we not telling this other cop that's coming? Why did he not tell Kyle? That is just fucking bananas to me. But even more bananas is Ladessa said, okay, he called 911. Can I get that recording? You record all the calls, right? Let me hear it. They say, sure, we'll get you the 911 call. Four months it took them to get her the 911 call. What in the fuck are you doing that it took you four months to get me that 911 call? Well, I think it took the Greenbergs almost a year to get... To get Ellen's? See, that just brings me to a place of, what are you hiding? What do you need to doctor? Why can't we just share this information? So is there speculation that it was doctored? Light, light speculation before fucking months to get a 911 call tape. That's bananas. Now going into the searches, you're going to love the cops even more. Brandon obviously was not heard from again after his phone went silent at 119. Kyle was out there, but he had his four-year-old and the child was starting to get hungry. And so he's like, well, I got to go feed my kid and take my wife back home. So they did all that. Then he comes back at around five o'clock in the morning. I should say Kyle and his wife, after the cop left, when they were all at Brandon's truck together, Kyle did go up the road a little bit to hide from the cop and then say, hey, Brandon, the cop's not here anymore and was like shouting for him. And of course, tried to call him a couple of times. But by that point, it was going to voicemail. And Brendan never came out. So he's like, well, whatever. He's probably still hiding. And so he came back at about five in the morning, did the whole, went up and down the highway a couple times and couldn't find Brandon. And so he's like, I'm just going to leave the gas can in the truck and call it a day. So the next morning, Brandon's truck was towed at about eight or nine o'clock. And they did the very entry level, I guess I'll say, investigation of the truck. They're like, Oh, let's just look at it and see if we see any oddities type of thing. 
There's no damage on the truck, so it doesn't seem like it got in any kind of accident. The doors were unlocked. There's no blood in or around the truck. The windows were halfway down. Brandon had taken his phone, his wallet, and his keys. So the police look at this and they're like, okay, this is an abandoned vehicle. We're just going to take it away. Again, I still don't know why we're not piecing the initial 911 call together with an abandoned vehicle and a missing person. Maybe I look at too much true crime, but if it was my first day on the job as a cop, I'd be like, maybe, maybe, maybe we should put those three things together. But it's not like there was even any kind of talk about location. I mean, he did say Abilene, but like maybe there was not enough information to connect those two together at all. Maybe, because I think at this point, Ladessa had not reported him as a missing person or called the cops yet. So wouldn't you as a minimum say, hey, ma'am, we're towing your husband's truck. I also want you to know he called 911 last night before his truck was towed and we can't find him. But they never even got a name. True. True. Okay. So maybe we didn't know that that 911 call came from Brandon until they pulled their records. Hang on. Maybe you're shedding more perspective on this in the favor of the police department. Maybe Ladessa knew more than the police department at that point. And maybe she pulled the records and said, hey, there's a 911 call that happened. And it was my husband. And they're like, holy shit. I don't think they put two and two together. Like, I'm fairly certain that anytime an abandoned vehicle gets towed, people probably just assume... They left it there to junk it, they're drunk, they're whatever, right? right? Gas, mechanical malfunction. I see that every day, a car on the side of the highway, and I don't think there's a full court investigation every time. They just put that sticker on it that's like, you have until this day to come pick up this car or... See, this is where you and I are different. I think every car abandoned on the side of the road is missing person. So Dessa did go out to search the next day. She went up and down the highway. She did go to all of the houses in the neighborhood because she did see that he had called the neighbor also and goes to the police with all this information. And the police basically say, one of our favorite sayings of all time, he probably just ran away on his own. He probably wanted to disappear. The police were convinced that he ran away with another woman and or. I guess they took her car. (laughs) And then like, why was he calling 911 if he was running? She just dropped him off in the field for a little bit to scare him till he called 911. And then she went and picked him up again. It was a small police force. I think they only had about five people on their team. But still, again, I never did police work a day in my life. I don't think if I had all the pieces, I would be like, yep, he's having an affair. Sorry. The other avenue that they were going hard on is Kyle is probably lying and Kyle probably gave him a ride to wherever he's going. So on August 11th, the police did decide to do a small search of their own. They came out to the land and had two officers do a four-hour search. Oh. Did they at least bring a dog? Not the first time. Dogs did eventually come. Here is how desolate this land. There's a Facebook user that did a 360 video of where Brandon's vehicle was found, and you'll see the cross for him in this. But it is fucking desolate, and I don't know how you search for just four hours, but here we go. There is a bridge... Off in the distance, up here. And this is where they thought maybe he's 10 minutes up the road and maybe he's like under this bridge because in other videos and pictures I saw, there is like a little ditch that goes down here that maybe he could have been hiding under. So back to this video. Okay. And this is probably during like spring or summer. So everything is very much grown and hard to see things. That would have been his truck. So that's where the cross is. And then that's what the road looked essentially behind him on the other side. I'm going to go back to my original thought of, I am not getting out of my car. That was in the middle of the day. That looks scary. I'm getting out of that at 1230 at night. 
Jamie, how aside. far was he from the river? If I did my research correctly, um, but I'm 90% sure this up here is that bridge that we were talking about, like maybe cars were going over and maybe this is a river underneath it. And so this would be the Colorado River. So not far. That's a speculation. That's a theory that people have that maybe he went to the water and perished in the water, drowned somehow. Ladessa, in addition to doing the initial small foot search right away, she also did a private helicopter search with a heat sensor a couple of days later. We're talking four or five days later. If he died that day, the heat sensor is going to pick up nothing, but let's still do it. Then after these initial, what I'll call baby searches, nothing turned up. And so on August 13th, she declared him as a missing person and filed the official report. So five days later, the police decided, oh, maybe this is a thing. We're going to do our own aerial search. Ladessa went back out and brought drones out. Now you might ask, when was later on? They did not decide to do a full search of the area until October 20. You've got to be fucking joking. August to October is like how many things could have happened. If he was in the river, now he's how far away. If he's eaten by animals, we're finding nothing. Why did we wait so long? When they did this official search on October 24th, they did bring out cadaver dogs they did have a couple other members of law enforcement. I think at this time, maybe they went from a two-person search to a three- or four-person search. Woo. Again, right. <laughs> but I guess, like, their department is only five people, so obviously it warranted nothing doing this search. Now, the cadaver dogs did hit on something. However, it was almost a bad idea to bring the cadaver dogs out because... Didn't know this until I researched this case, but anytime you're in an area with wild boars or wild hogs, it throws a cadaver dog scent off and so doesn't really do them any favors. Ladessa, after that, did one more search of her own. They did get, obviously, some traction from like local news stories and things like that. One thing that I thought was interesting, I found this out while I was listening to the Crawl Space episode, which Lance and Tim did a phenomenal job of really diving deep into this case. But very interesting, Jason Watts, and if you're close to the Maura Murray case or you're close to the Brianna Maitland case, both of which we covered. So if you haven't listened to our coverage on those, go back and listen. Anyways, on Lance and Tim's Crawl Space episode, Jason Watts teamed up with them for this Brandon Lawson case. And the reason why, Jason actually went to school with Brandon Lawson. So that was a pretty cool connection. And so he really led the charge with reaching out to Ladessa, figuring out what he could do. And they started reaching out to social media, getting more into law enforcement, and starting doing some of these searches. Now, they were initially met with a lot of pushback because a lot of this desolate land was owned by private people and a lot of it was used for hunting. And so even the people that own the land didn't necessarily live there. And so it was hard to get in contact with them. Then Brian used drugs, Kyle used drugs. Odessa admitted to using drugs at one point in her life. So this family was not very well liked by the police. And that just really frustrates me because at the end of the day, a life is a life. And I don't give a fuck what that person did. They still deserve the right to being found, to having their case looked at, or even if someone's on trial, to having a fair trial. And I'll die on this hill, no matter what a person did, that's somebody's son or daughter. And we have to respect that. For the police to just say, oh, that's just a drug family and whatever. And they just treated them not great. I should say at least one of the law enforcement officials. I don't think all of them were that way. And so the, the trouble they ran into when they were trying to do these searches is, and Ladessa said, you know, in the beginning, these people were very open to me going on their land and searching the property and doing our thing. As law enforcement started to get more and more involved, 
they came in and said, we can't have anybody getting hurt on this property. You can't go in and search this property, et cetera, et cetera. And Ledessa even went in and said, well, I'll sign off on a waiver and saying we will take full responsibility of that. And the law enforcement was like, I don't give a fuck what you do. You're still not going on this property to search. I think there's even one time where they were going to do a search. And I think for sure Kyle might have been at this search. And they were trying to go onto the land. And the police met them at the land and said, what are you doing here? We are trying to make sure that you're not trespassing. So if you're trying to go search for your brother over there, don't even think about doing it. Which is just bananas to me because if you have a missing person who obviously was in some trouble because there's a 911 call that you took four months to give me the transcript of or the recording of. And now you're trying to block me from going on the property. It's not a good look for you. That went back and forth for a very, very, very long time. And the cops really had nothing to show for it. Ladessa had nothing to show for it up until 2022. Allspace actually did a pretty cool update episode with the Brandon Lawson case where Lance, Tim, Ladessa, Jason, and one other person were at CrimeCon. They talked about what they discovered in 2022 with Brandon. Jason was really leading the charge with this, and he finally got in in touch with one of the landowners. So this individual finally got back to him and said, oh my gosh, we don't even live in that area. We didn't even know he was missing. 100% go on our land and search. So Jason got a small team together. They went out and searched this day in January of 2022. They have been searching almost all the morning. They're going through a lot of this thick brush and couldn't come up with anything. So it gets to be about lunchtime. They all come back to their cars, refuel, recharge, come up with a new plan. And Jason says, hey, there's this area of land tucked way over in this corner here that's open, but also nobody's really searched it. We're all kind of defeated. Let's at least cover this area because it's easy to cover. We don't have to go through this crazy terrain. Uh, I'm going to get goosebumps because I was listening to it today and it just like sent shivers. But they're doing this grid search and Jason looked up and he said, I saw her staring at the ground at something. And he said, what do you see? What's going on? And she said, I see a white tennis shoe. And that sent chills down everybody. So Brandon, the night that he went missing, was wearing white Nike Air Max shoes, gray camo shorts, and I think a bright yellow shirt. They found this Nike Air Max, and it was only part of the shoe. They stopped everything, and they're like, oh, this could be Brandon's. He was wearing this type of shoe. Not even 100 feet away, they find another shoe. And then not even... 50 yards away from that, they find the the shorts. While we can't say for certain they're Brandon's, I mean, it's a pretty good indication, right? Obviously, they don't touch anything. They all go back to the cars. He calls law enforcement. They have to wait there for a while until law enforcement can come. And they collect the evidence. I believe DNA testing was done on that. And the clothing and the shoes were officially said to be Brandon's. So then law enforcement finally did a real search in this area after the clothing was found. And they were able to find some bones that came back to be human remains. It's not a lot of bones, but it's enough to do some testing on. The only thing that DNA testing has come back so far is to say that it is a male individual that they found. And again, this is over two years ago. They still cannot confirm that it's Brandon I guess a lot of the bone fragments that they found were small. And so every time you chip away at a piece of the bone to test for DNA, you have less and less to test. And so if this part gets messed up somehow, what are we going to do and how are we going to test the rest of it? The family fully believes that this is Brandon. So Ledessa put a statement out there. Brandon's father put a statement out there that basically says, obviously it's not the outcome that we wanted, but we feel like we have some closure here. We feel like we found Brandon and we feel like we can lay our heads down at night. These clothing items and uh, human remains were found less than a mile from where his truck was found that night. And so to me, it's just really sad that this communication tree didn't go through and we didn't know that he called 911 earlier 
and that he really was in trouble and could we have put a bigger search effort out that night to maybe find him alive or maybe find him if he was struggling and needing help to get him to a hospital or worst case scenario, find him the next morning when we could still identify his body. And instead, now we're over 10 years out and we're trying to identify a small piece of bone and see if it's his. That is the information that I know up until this point. The only other thing I will note is Ladessa still has a very, very, very good relationship with all of Brandon's family, including all of his siblings and his parents. And they do still celebrate holidays together on a pretty regular basis, which I thought was pretty cool. That was heavier saying it out loud than it was writing it. So questions, thoughts? A mile doesn't seem that far. We always hear the three mile radius. Right. With that logic, there's no reason he shouldn't have been found. Maybe he wouldn't have been alive, but he would have been found remains in or his body, right? To where it was definitive enough to give closure to the family. If we say a wild animal took him, could they have taken him so far out that you went to find him in your little four hour search? And then brought him back to that place. Like that just would be bananas to me that they took him out and then brought him back to this place. And then you missed him when you were doing your eight to 12 search. Maybe anything's possible. Like win the lottery tomorrow too. I think it's a mix of when you have these small town police forces and it's like, yes, I get it. You think you can handle it. But why is it such a big ego thing to call in the state police? Or they did call Texas Ranger in for one of the searches. I don't think it was until 21 days after the disappearance, the police did another search. And at that point, they hired the Texas Rangers back to your three mile radius. We're searching a three mile radius on a grid by grid basis. Right. You are going to find something that's a mile away. I think back to, and it's a a crazy analogy, but my parents, when I was little, we had a fenced in yard and we had a dog. And they used to make my brother and I pick up dog poop. I would essentially do a grid by grid search of the yard to pick up dog poop until I got to the end of the yard. So I would like to think I could have probably found Brandon because I would have done that foot by foot search like this. And if I'm just a little girl picking up dog poop, surely the police know how to do that, right? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I need to go get a job as a Texas Ranger. Well, then we could go to actual happy hours. I mean, after the day I had at work today, it's it's not off the realm of possibilities. I just did a quick Google and it says, yes, wild boars can kill humans, though attacks are rare and fatal attacks are even rarer. Wild boars are typically not aggressive unless they feel threatened. Yeah, I will say they're really fucking mean, though. We had some in our neighborhood. I never encountered them, but think about... If you're in the dark and you don't know any better, he could have tripped over a baby. He could have kicked a baby running through the woods. And then a boar is like, fuck you. And then goes to run after him. And that's why he initially calls 911 because he's like, I got one of them. I got one of them. And then when he says, no, I need the cops because I need somebody to shoot them. And then could call his brother later and be like, I'm bleeding. I still go back to... That 25-minute gap between the 911 call. 12.50 and one eighteen, yeah. And the cop and Kyle arriving. If you are in a dire situation, I don't care. You're going to run out or you're going to yell. or I'm here. I'm here. Help me. Yeah, not say one time, run, motherfucker. Whatever happened resolved itself somehow. So whatever happened, happened after his phone went dead. Or after the last call he made out. Another crazy speculation popped in my head. Oh, well, I'm glad that you have speculations because I have none. <laughs> he could have overdosed. He could have. Yeah, that would be so sad. Been but injured just, yeah. just by the terrain. Fallen and hit his head on something. Do we know do boars eat? bones like where the fuck is the rest of the body oh gosh pigs will feed on human analogs and will consume soft tissue bones and human teeth (laughs) just in case you never wanted 
to sleep again. <laughs> How many missing people are in the belly of a hog? <gasps> Thought. Everyone that we've covered? Possibly. But what if, now this could be a crazy path to go down, but I wonder what the digestive track is for a bone but okay here's what i'm saying this like could we essentially kill wild hogs in these areas and rip their bellies open to see what kind of bones are in there we can test dna on bones we know this because that's what we're waiting 700 years for here and how many missing people could i don't know what kind of answer that would give us like okay they were eaten by a hog and okay Alert, could all wild boars please report to your nearest police station? We would like to test your digestive tract, please. Full immunity, we just need to know. We just want the bones. That's it. Just a small surgery. Just put you under for a second. I'll just grab the bones out, stitch you back up. Whoa. Go watch your daily human <laughs> eating life. Boars was... Definitely one of my speculations, though, because I listened to that 911 call about 700 times. And one of the podcasts said it could sound like he was saying boars at one point. And there is wild boars all over there. And when he says, I got one of them, like we just talked about earlier, that could be it. And that could be I was being chased by him or he pushed them or whatever. Or when he said, I accidentally ran into him. That could have been it. Like maybe mm -hmm. when he ran out of gas, he ran into a group of them. But I would think that we would have seen damage on his truck. But maybe not. What if he just like kind of ran up on them? But then I go back to if I am coming up on a group of wild boars, I'm not getting out of my truck. I don't mean to laugh, but just the thought of seeing a boar and then imagining it's five. And he said Mexicans were chasing him out of the neighborhood. I, who knows? Maybe. Do we know if his shorts were like in good condition? They or didn't the, say. The found they, could, shorts? they could tell that they were shorts and they were camo, but they didn't say if they were like the full shorts or if I imagine piece, we're talking 10 years later. If the one shoe was just a piece of it, then. And it was like embedded into the ground, but they could still tell it was a white nike air max so it wasn't completely ruined but then if a boar did eat him why didn't he eat the shoes they don't like nikes they like teeth better do you have other speculations other than the boars i'm gonna have to go with accident slash misadventure just for lack of yeah. anything concrete i definitely think he died that night I think so, too. Something prevented him from making it back to his truck. Otherwise, worst case, I'm just going to pass out in here. See, and that's what's so. crazy to me, too, because when we watched that video of the 360, because some people said, well, he must have just got lost in the woods and died. But I'm like, you walked into the woods and wherever you were in the woods, you could see the road. So it's just bananas to me that you couldn't get back to the road. Wild boars is what makes sense in that situation to me. Or or he got bit by a snake. A, a rattlesnake's poisonous, yes, I think. Are there poisonous scorpions? There's probably all kinds of stuff out there. Like stuff that could kill you and or incapacitate you, right? It could have been like a wild cat. The other thing that it could have been, and this is, I thought the wild boars was going to be my crazy speculation, but maybe this is going to be my crazy speculation. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Okay, so it took them four months to get the 911 tape over to her. And in the 911 call, we hear him say, Staper, think of it what you will. I think it's State Trooper. Just pulled some guys over. Some people say just push some guys over. Either way, a Staper, in my opinion, State Trooper did something to some guys. And as the call goes on, he talks about something, got the first one, shot the first one, did whatever to the first one. So there's somebody else there in addition to that. And then he just goes silent for whatever reason. I hate this, and this is pure speculation, and I hope this isn't the case, but I think it's something maybe we need to put into our heads. The police took four months to get her that tape. If we 
go along with what he was saying, there might have been some kind of, maybe not law enforcement, but some kind of authority there with him where he's saying something happened with these people and we need help. And then you couple that with law enforcement didn't love this family. They thought they were just a bunch of loser drug addicts. And then you add on to that, hey, family, when you want to go search this property, I'm going to make it hell for you to go do that. So were they trying to cover something up? And were the police thinking, if we get this guy, like maybe drugs will not be in our area anymore. And so an initial thought process, sure, that makes sense to me. Maybe some law enforcement pulled him over. They got into some scuffle, some trouble happened. Maybe he got shot. He tried to call 911. Maybe they caught him. They tucked his body away or not even tucked his body away. He, they traced him into this area and he died. And then they didn't want her to find out about it. So they took forever to get rid of the 911 tape so they can make sure they edited it properly. And they didn't want them to go on the property because they hoped that they would never find the body again. So all that makes sense to me. But to talk myself out of it, if that was what was happening, why would he call 911 if the cops were truly after dead. him? Right. And specifically say, I need the cops. cops. But bring the boat back to the island because what if it was like a, and probably not because the cops weren't going to know that he was out that night. Like they didn't know he was going to get in a fight with Odessa. But what if he could have hired somebody to go after him and then said that? I don't know. Something seems very off to me that you can't produce a 911 tape for four months and then you don't want to conduct a true search for two and a half months. The amount of time on the 911 call, that doesn't surprise me at all because we hear it all the time. It leads you to think something is going on, but we know that they didn't take it seriously. So it probably wasn't priority number one or priority number 50. Small police force. Yeah, five people. It could have been something completely unassuming no focus on it no prioritization not enough people every day that goes on yeah we know you still need it but we have other stuff going on too sure i don't think that is completely out of line now searching the property the fact that it was private property a that's mile. a thing that's a thing though you do have to i know you have to get through all of that by the permission book. It's not like right. that's just like open land. And those people didn't actually live on the land. So that's extra steps within their process. I think it changed owners a couple times within the years too. I'm not saying that they didn't make it harder, but I don't know that that was by their actual doing. I think combining, they didn't really give a shit about this. Plus it's private property. And if we're going to do this, we have have to get permission that meant that they had to do the work to get the permission. I'm not saying it's great or right by any means, but I could see how it happened. Yeah. And so I guess like non nefarious. Right. Like maybe not nefarious and almost like a, the example I'll give is like a lie by omission. And what I mean by that is we don't love this family. And so we're not going to go above and beyond to make them priority two. We're going to keep them at priority 54 because yeah, add that we have no it. reason. Yeah. So maybe not necessarily that anybody from law enforcement was nefarious, but more or less just we're just could not going to fucking care about it or do anything about it. Could have been just to like a series of misfortunate factors that played all into this. Yeah, I could see that. Then I just go back to, I've never taken meth. I don't know what it does to you, but like maybe he had a bad trip. And a lot of things I listened to said it could have been laced with something. So we don't know that. Maybe it was just a crazy bad trip. And he thought he saw something that he didn't. And the boars got him. And his teeth. And I'm going to have nightmares tonight. For sure. They eat teeth? Are you sure? That's what the Google machine just told me. And I wish that I hadn't seen it. Somebody fact check it. Double, triple, quadruple <laughs> check it. Make sure. If it gets worse than teeth, just don't tell me. <laughs> I don't want to know that it gets worse than teeth. I do want to say shout out to Jamie because one of her sources is my favorite podcast and also her arch nemesis. And thank you. 
Yes, I did listen to your people. However, I always tell Janelle, and this is a true statement that she could probably pull from her text messages. I always say, well, it's the last day of me doing research on this case. So I'm going to begrudgingly listen to XYZ podcast now. And I'm sure I'm going to text you in 30 minutes and tell you how pissed off I am. It happened. <laughs> and then she texts me back and says, why are you mad? These people are great. The good news is, in this case, they did get some answers. I think the family does truly believe that these bones are going to be Brandon's. Hopefully by the end of 2024, we find out that they are his. And what I mean by hopefully is not that I want him to be no longer alive, but I do want the family to have some closure. Because Ladessa did say when they got this news, it was one of the first Easter's that they had a really happy family gathering because they felt like they had something that they could build on. And she even said one of her kids went on some really crazy island like Jamie and said daddy's just being out there being like a superhero and he defied all elements or something to that extent <clears throat> so they are still having some hope but I think all in all they understand that this is probably Brandon so I am happy in my heart at least for that that they have some closure there however I know that it opens it up to a whole lot more questions that are unfortunately unanswered for them if anybody does have any information with regard to Brandon Lawson's disappearance, I do ask that you reach out to the Texas Department of Public Safety. And that phone number is 512-424-5074. Although we may know that Brandon's demise was met, we still don't quite know what happened to him. So unfortunately, until we have those answers, all we can do is speculate wildly. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our show today. We genuinely appreciate any and all support. We would love if you would please subscribe, like, comment, or download on any of your favorite platforms that you go to for podcasts. Did today's episode leave you with more to say or have a theory that we didn't discuss or even a case that you love to hear us talk about? Head on over to our Facebook discussion group, you can search SWAC Pod, S W A C P O D discussion group, and leave any suggestions, comments, etc. There. To feel a little bit more comfortable via email, we can also be reached at swackpod at gmail.com. That's S W A C P O D at gmail.com. Any and all feedback is incredibly helpful to us. And until next time, stay curious, stay safe, and keep speculating wildly.